Hello, and welcome to this webinar titled Extractables and Leachables Have Been Used Interchangeably for Too Long. Are We Still Confused? Hosted by Biopharma Asia Magazine and presented by Ken Wong, Deputy Director at Sanofi Pasteur and Don DeCou, Extractable and Leachable Technology Manager at West Pharmaceutical Services. My name is Stephen Edwards, and I'll be your moderator. Now, our first presenter, Ken Wong, is a Deputy Director of Process Technology Platform at Sanofi Pasteur serving as a Swift Water Site Extractables and Leachables SME, but also providing E&L supports to all global sites. His 19 years in biopharma professional career has ranged from R&D to development and commercialization to CGMP manufacturing support. For the last 17 years, he has specialized in E&L in wide ranges of packaging systems, including lyophilized powders, oral liquids, creams, ophthalmatic solutions, transdermal, biosurgical delivery systems, injectable devices, and inhalation devices for aerosols, solutions, and powders. In the last 10 years, he has been heavily involved with single-use technology and actively participating in disposable work streams or Bioforum Operations Group, the USP665 Expert Panel, and the LC Material Working Group. I will now be handing over to our first presenter. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I'd like to, um, this is more of a curiosity from my part. After working on this field for so long, and I always have been hearing the term that people saying, they, they always say it depends on who they talk to. The extractable and reachable term can be used interchangeably for too long. And trying to explore and understand where we will use the term to describe the data set and this is a kind of exercise going through with all of you, and hopefully we can see how different we are at each other perspective. So I will start with the survey. The reason I would do that is that I do not want to influence anybody understanding of how you use the terminology right now. I just want to capture the current thinking of everyone, and then we can explore some of those concepts and the gray zone that I will, I will touch on. So first and foremost, I want to mention that the, the concept that I'm describing here is basically my idea. It's not representing my company and our current practice at Sanofi. All right, so on the screen, what you're looking at is the first survey, which is the case study here we are going, going to go through for the survey. And to remind you, there's attachment on this webinar you can download, which you will see the same page. I recommend you to do so because that will help you to have it in front of you as you go through the survey questions later on. So in this case one, what we have is that it's an arbitrary drug product that I make up. So for example, this is a LDPE squeezable bottle, and it's going to be filled with burn release cream or ointment. And the application is for open wound care. So if you think about packaging in terms of um, raw administration, so it's not injectable, but it's not a transdermal also or topical. It's on an open wound. So it's kind of in between. And then as far as the packaging configuration goes, the market presentation will come in three sizes. The first one is 5 mil. It's a travel size that you carry with you, 50 mil, which is an emergency kit or for home care, and then 250 mil container for hospital use or clinic use. Okay, and then for the dose, you can apply approximately half a mil to a one centimeter square burn area when you have burn. And then the storage condition is two years at 20 degrees C, so below is a list of formulation of this uh, drug product. So it contains about 10% essential oil, 15% antibiotic ingredient, that's the API, 50% pectolectum, 20% allogel, paraben, EDTA, and methyl. And for any of the chemists on the line there, you can see this is not an easy formulation for you to analyze analytically. So, so kind of capture that in your mind, and 
I suggest you to download the the link that are the attachment that are in the presentation right now, so you see this same page, and you have it handy in front of you. Okay, so as we're proceeding to the survey question, so what we're trying to do is to understand your minimum criteria for the study design factor. At that point, once you have the study is designed, at the end, would you describe the data as legible, or rather, you would describe the data as extractable? And the four factors that I'm capturing here is what we'll be serving coming up soon. One is the contents factor, which means the drug product, the placebo, the simulation solvent, and so on and so forth. And the second one is Envica method factors, whether you test the, the solution with non-targeted methods or targeted methods. The third one is the form factor on the packaging configuration standpoint, the smaller size versus the larger size, include or not including the label, and don't forget this is the LDP portal, so it's permeable. And then the last one is the aging factor. So. Before I pull out the survey, I'm just going to review this with you, and I encourage you to ask questions as you go. I'm sure there will be tons of questions, and I'm trying to answer some of them before we start the survey. So the way the survey goes is it go across the board from the top to the bottom. So on a drug product content, if it's a literature study, you are using a drug product content, which is answer E when the survey come up. So knowing that you may have challenge in analyzing the drug product, you may decide to use a placebo, which is a C. And then D and E is the drug product formulation, but you treat the sample differently and how you want to be able to manipulate so that you can analyze them and inject into your instruments and then as you go down to model solvent. And then the next set of questions come up is, if you do choose C or D in your answer, what type of liquid-liquid exchange or extraction recovery limit that you will accept? To think this is a legitimate, a legitimate study. So A is 50 to 150% recovery, D is 80 to 120. Okay, and then the third one would be for your targeted methods. So if you use a targeted literature method, would you make sure that the method is fully validated, which is answer C? Can you accept partially validated method, which is answer B? It's similar to a limit test, for example, or maybe more. Or you can accept a screening method, but with some spike targeted legible compounds in there, if you know which one you're targeting. And if so, what kind of minimum validation challenges would you accept? Um, for those A and B, if you choose those, uh, you might be able to put in the survey, sorry, in the chat box, what are the minimum validation challenges that you will challenge them? For example, specificity, linearity, or recovery, and so on and so forth. And then along with the same line of ethical methods, say you will test them with a non-targeted method, typically known as screening methods here. Would you want the screening method to be spike with some known probable eligible also, which is the answer C for that survey question. And then the next step is on the packaging configuration. Remember we have three sizes here. Do you need all three sizes, which is answer D, or can you accept worst case approach? It could be a different answer. Okay. So the next step is if you do use packaging, the actual package, do you want to put the label on? And if so, do you need the commercial, a commercially approved label, which has all the artwork approved by quality, for example? Or you would accept maybe a pilot label with some color strips 
based on whatever color you use in your commercial label, which is the B, or no labels at all. And then last but not least is the storage condition up to shelf life. So do you want to have the actual normal storage condition at 20 degrees C for 24 months, no accelerator condition, or you can accept accelerator condition based on different model like the ASTM F1980 or the factor of 10 rules. Okay, so we will kick off the survey right now and if you have any questions please put on the chat. I will let you we'll go through it one by one just so that we can capture every single one before we go to the presentation and then at the end we're going to review the result from all the input from everyone. So we can start the survey now. The poll okay. Can we start the post even? Stephen, sorry. The questions are now live, and as a reminder, they will be one question at a time. We will let uh, enough time for each question to be open for around a 60 seconds. Thank you. Yeah, as you go through them and you have questions, just put on the chat box, and I'll try to answer some. Some of them you have to use your own assumption in your mind because there may be different scenario in your head that you're trying to evaluate. So Stephen, if you see any question on the chat, let me know. I'm trying to monitor also. Thank you. Okay, I think we are about ready to move on to the next one. Okay, we'll be moving to second question. And remember the second question is for those who select C or D in your answer. And if you do liquid liquid exchange, what is your minimum recovery for a target and the lights that you're willing to accept? If 
if you did not choose answer C or D for question one, you can skip the second question. Okay, we're now on question number six. Okay, now we're down to the last question. Right, so we're closing our survey. Thank you all for your participation. And we're going to review the result shortly after the presentation. Okay, let me move on to the next slide. And the next step, what I'd like to do is to quickly go over some of the definition. And so I'm sure most of you are probably well aware of that. So first of all, I'm just going to kind of talk through this, what I call e &L continuum in terms of the study design standpoint. And many of you have heard different terms in terms of extraction study. You can, you can call it assortive extraction study, control extraction study, a saturated extraction study, and so on and so forth. And then the latest concept was called simulation study. There's also provided in detail in USP 1663 and 1664. And then you have literature study. So as you approach from the left to right, as you can see, the goal is to perform your extraction study that are as much as possible cover the entire literature study bubble, as illustrated in the picture here. So, so 
the survey that you have gone through is basically exploring this gray zone that I call it. And it's very tricky here because it really depends on who you talk to. Some would describe the data set as extractable data, and some would say this is eligible data. And certainly, everybody will say if you perform simulation study, they are considered probably eligible or likely eligible, and so on and so forth. Those adjectives for eligible get make us confused because they are probable, they are likely, therefore they describe the data as eligible data. They may not be the case. So in our next slide here, so we're looking at some definition that we have seen. Um, the first one is from the FDA, which is probably the oldest one that I have found. Basically, compounds can be extracted from a container closure system in the presence of a solvent. So very, very limited information. And then in ISO 10993, they split up three different types of extraction. You have accelerated extraction that yeah, are focused on the condition of the time that you want to shorten it. So you're going to basically shorten the time by accelerating the temperature. Right? And it do not result in the chemical change. So your temperature increase cannot be so high that it would impact your leachable profile or extractable profile in this case. And then you have exhaustive extractions where you're trying to extract as much as you can until you almost deplete everything in the package. And the way it defined is that if you do it in subsequent extraction, your next one will yield less than 10% of the first extraction profile. And then the last one is the simulated extraction, which is similar to the simulation extraction in the USP 1663 and 1664. Basically, you do it as little as you can just by modifying the media to simulate your drug product formulation. And then in the next one, we have the USP definition. This to me probably is the most descriptive because it tell you here for extraction study, you need to make sure your lab conditions, including your solvent temperature, stoichiometry, et cetera, et cetera, that you use is to accelerate or exaggerate the normal conditions. So that includes shorten your storage time duration and then the package material that you will be using. So the data that you generated here, they, I think for everybody, I wouldn't even have to ask. You will easily describe them as extractable data set. And then if you go on, there's other definition coming from ASME, BPE, as well as PQI. And they are a little less descriptive, like the USP, but they cover additional information. Some of them will mention about solvent polarity, for example, in the ASME, BPE as well as pH, duration and exposure time, and then storage condition. Uh, as far as how vigorous you are in terms of the PQI, in terms of lab condition. So if we move down to the literature definition, from FDA standpoint in the uh, definition based on the, survey, uh, the presentation I have seen is that the compound that leach into the drug product formulation. So here, this is very clear, is the drug product formulation, right? In the container is the result of direct contact. And then the USP has a little bit more detail. It's from your packaging or delivery system. So in this case here, we, we just survey is the packaging component under normal condition or accelerated conditions. So it can be at 20 degrees C, which is our recommended storage condition, or it can be at your accelerated condition that you will perform the study at. Now, here it doesn't tell you that you that leachable definition means that you can use placebo or model solvent. And then the next one from ASME BPE, as well as PQRI, they are also very specific in terms of drug product. They call it drug product formulation in both cases. And under normal conditions, it doesn't say accelerated in some of this, uh, except the PQI. So what we end up with here, we have 
very general terminology from E and L. But when things are fall in the gray zone, it is up to us sometimes whether you're willing to describe your data set as extractable data or leachable data. And you can think of it for yourself when you submit this for regulatory submission. Do you describe this as your extractable data set or your leachable data set? So, so in the definition here, it doesn't say if you do a sterility condition, does it have to follow certain specific model? And I think for most of us, we will accept any model that are reasonable, which still based on Arrhenius equation. And the clear thing here from all the definition we have gone through is drug product versus placebo or model solvent. So the drug product line seems to be pretty clear. But when we get to the study design factor, we have many, many things to consider. We have material construction, we have the form factor, which is basically the LDP border in this case, or it can be your resin bits if you want. And then you have solvent, time, the, the weight, and then the extraction technique. So in this case, the extraction techniques for the most part, we just fill the squeezable border with your motor solvent and so on. The temperature, the treatment here in this case is not critical because we, I didn't describe it so much. It may have gone through terminal sterilization or the material might be come in sterilized and then the drug product might be sterilized before fill. So it's a septic filling process. But then the next one is potential interaction with the ingredient. And for most of you are looking at this example, your sorry, I forgot to advance the slide. <laughs> for for most of you are looking at the example, you are most concerned with the matrix interference, which is somewhere in the lower right corner. Pressure vacuum is not much of a concern here in this in this example. And then your test method. So the test method. If you remember, look at the definition of the survey, uh, saw the, sorry, the definition of the extractive and leachable, none of them mentioned that the method needs to be validated or with targeted compound. So that's a gray zone that what you think must be done. And then sample handling, which include the liquid liquid extraction or dilution. That's in first question. So going through the next slide, if you looking at almost like the same thing as the continuum that we talked about. So we're looking at the content in terms of fluid matrix. On the far right, you have drug product formulation, exactly what you have in literature study. If you believe the API is interfering, you might go to back one step to use placebo. Or you have other ingredients that are interfering with your analytical instrumentation, you might go one step back to use representative formulation, or a little bit back for aggregate solution or model solution, and then model solvent, a pure ethanol, IPA, and those. So that is the scale that you can look at. The second one on the form factor standpoint, the final form would be your actual um, bottle in this case, that gone through your QC release and treatment, if there's a treatment involved or just the QC release component. And it can be basically a scaled down version. So of the three sizes that we talk about, so one of you might say, well, we think the five mil will be representative. So you might use the five mil in your study to bracket the other. They could be treated. They may be non-treated if it's still a pilot run. It's the whole production for the border is not validated yet. So those are the situation where you may not want to treat it yet. Or you can use a polymer strip or the resin pallet all the way back to the source. So to the next one here. Uh, sorry, back. Yeah. So to the back one here, what you have now is aging factor. The aging factor you can Based it on the ICHQ1A, which is the stability study, aging factor. Or you can base on 
the normal condition up to shelf life plus your aging factor in both. Or you can use the normal condition plus the ASTM model and go back by dropping your normal condition altogether. So remember some of the definition for leachable is that you can accept that data set if it's accelerated condition. And some did not point that out specifically. So if you go back to the last two ones, that say the ASTM model and the factor of 10 rule, over here you have no normal condition up to shelf life, which means that you're not performing a study at 20 degrees C up to two years for that experiment. The last factor here would be the analytical method, as I mentioned earlier, and that is not described in any of definition. It can be validated, it can be a screening method, it can be a qualified method, anything in between. All right, so going into the conclusion right now, I would like to ask Stephen to present the survey result and see where we all stand on the majority. Steve, can you present the survey? Hi, Ken. Unfortunately, due to the platform, I will not be able to present the results just yet. Okay. Um, in that case, why don't we switch and then maybe we'll do it at the very end. That sounds like a good idea. Um, so, please... The Thank you. Once again, I'd like to remind our viewers that there will be a live Q&A session at the end of the webinar. But please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. And we'll go through these at the end of the presentation. So thank you for that, Ken. Now please allow me to introduce our second speaker. Dr. Deku's current position is that of Extractable and Leachable Technology Manager at West Pharmaceutical Services. His primary responsibility is to develop and increase knowledge of industry and technology as it applies to extractables and leachables and to effectively support West in identifying and growing future analytical expertise. Don has been working in the pharmaceutical industry for over 20 years with increasing responsibilities relating to extractables and leachables in roles ranging from analyst, supervisor, subject matter expert and manager. He has worked for companies such as 3M in their Pharmaceuticals Drug Delivery Systems Division, PPD, Covance, Alchemy, and Pace Analytical. He received his PhD in Analytical Chemistry from Kansas State University in 1993. I will now be handing over to our second presenter. Welcome, Dr. Stegui. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, before I get started, I want to go over uh, uh, some of my background. Uh, Stephen, you did a really good job introducing me. But my name is Don Deku, and I am the Extractable Leachable Technology Manager at West Pharmaceuticals. And I've been working in the pharmaceutical industry for well over 20 years now. Uh, I got my start in the mid-90s working for uh, 3M, where I was working on their valves for meter dose inhaler uh, products. There I was mainly an analyst and I was uh, extracting a lot of rubber diaphragms, a lot of O-rings, and a lot of different uh, types of uh, container closure systems as it related to um, uh, meter dose inhalers. And I was also performing some uh, leachable studies in um, placebo formulations. But all this was uh, during the switch from the CFC-based propellants to the HFA-based propellants. And then subsequently, I worked for a variety of contract research organizations as, uh, in a variety of roles, which led me to my current position at West Pharmaceuticals. And I've been working here for just over a month now, and I'm very excited to be a, a part of the West team. So from Ken's presentation, we should all know uh, the different uh, definitions for extractables and leachables and um, the need to perform a well-planned and effective extractable study. The issues that I'm going to talk about is uh, what you do with extractable data once you have your complete set of extractable data and use that to perform uh, and plan leachable studies. 
I will discuss uh, quality risk management and a variety of ICH guidelines that use the concept. And remember that one size does not fit all here, and a variety of approaches can be used um, that varies with the amount of risk that a particular drug developer is willing to take on. I will discuss the correlation of extractable data to leachable data, and that has been used to um, plan um, future uh, leachable studies or simulation studies. And I will also present three case studies where risk assessment uh, has been used to address specific issues according to a biologic uh, system. Running an effective extractable and leachable program is all about maintaining quality product and ensuring patient safety. Leachable compounds have no therapeutic value, and they can potentially harm patients that are exposed to them, and they can affect the purity and efficacy of a particular therapy. So as such, is there any wonder why the FDA has, uh, and other agencies has been steadily increasing their requirements over the last uh, 15, 20 years or so? Quality risk management concepts are being incorporated into more and more guidances, and some of them that affect the drug product manufacturer are presented here. We have ICHQ8 for pharmaceutical product development, ICHQ9 for quality risk management, ICHQ10 for quality risk management systems, and ICHQ12 for pharmaceutical product life cycle management. As I mentioned earlier, one size does not fit all when it comes to risk assessment and risk management. There are so many different types of products and each will have its own unique attributes that need to be assessed from a risk assessment perspective. So for example, let's compare the risks associated with two different dosage forms. These are uh, number one, orally inhaled and nasal drug products, and then number two, parenteral and ophthalmic products. And each of these have unique and differing, differing risk uh, as dosage forms. For example, a meter dose inhaler, um, these are used solvents with a strong, uh, strong solvents uh, as propellants, such as the HFAs that were used uh, to phase out the CFCs early in uh, the development cycle. So we have strong organic compounds exposed to uh, rubber and elastomer uh, components. So that is just begging for compounds to migrate from the rubber into the strong solvents and eventually be dosed to a patient. So anything that could potentially be extracted from these uh, rubber material into these strong solvents will be leachables and they will be dosed to a patient directly to the lung. So that, this is one of the first areas that the FDA became concerned about from extractable leachable point of view. You know, that you're dosing directly to a compromised lung and you don't want a potentially, you know, routine asthma attack to go into a critical or worst case asthma attack due to the presence of some of these leachables, which can be known sensitizers. Compare that to parenteral and ophthalmic um, drug formulations. Here we're talking about pre-filled syringes, small and large volume parenteral vials, and uh, products that are dosed topically uh, to the eye. In this case, um, the dosages are primarily aqueous, and uh, some compounds that are present as extractables might not be soluble in your drug uh, product formulation due to the high aqueous nature of the, the drug formulation. But in this case, pH effects matter. A lot of these um, uh, parenteral type products can have a wide variety of pHs, whether it's low, neutral, or, or high pHs. And you have to take that into account as you're doing your drug, um, uh, drug development program. So there's different risks associated with different dosage forms. 
The risks for extractable and leachables must be addressed over the entire product life cycle, starting in the early development in phase two, continuing into phase three, and it doesn't stop there. You have to take a risk uh, into account later on in the uh, product's life cycle in, um, in the after commer commercialization stages. So I'm going to give some case studies about each of these three different stages of the product development life cycle. From the early stage, I will speak to a metal interactions with a human lysosome. In the phase three stage, I'll speak to leachables uh, from stoppers and comparing that to the extractable profile. And from, from the post-product approval stage, I will speak to a change in a sterilizable bag that is used to hold uh, rubber stoppers. The concepts of ICH, Q8, Q9, and Q10 can provide guidelines for science and risk-based approaches for drug development and risk-based re regulatory issues. ICHQ12 uh, applies to drug products, uh, drug products including uh, marketed and chemical and biological drug products as well as combination drug products. And it provides guidance to the commercial uh, phase of the product's life cycle in a more predictable and efficient manager, manage. Strategies can be applicable across multiple products and uh, effective use of uh, Q12 strategies can enhance a drug developer's ability to manage CMC changes effectively with less need for extensive regulatory oversight prior to implementation. But one thing should be uh, mentioned, which we need to stress, is that effective implementation of Q12 will be difficult unless a developer embraces Q8 and Q9, Q10, and um, Q11 as well. In most cases, a drug uh, developer is in control of a manufacturing process. However, there can be instances where changes happen that are beyond uh, their control. For example, let's take an, an injectable drug product. In this case, we have a glass vial sealed with a rubber stopper and an aluminum, uh, an aluminum seal. The drug manufacturer can have control of the um, formulating, the mixing, the filling, and the sealing process. And um, they can also have uh, some assurance that the supplier of the glass vials and or rubber stoppers and aluminum seals have control of their process as well. But what happens if uh, the base, uh, base rubber raw material changes some of their processes or the N4, the additives uh, supplier, changes some of their additives? Can the end user, the drug product manufacturer, Maintain, maintain control at that level? Uh, the answer is, of course, you know, not necessarily. And that's where risk management processes and ICHQ12 can help. So the purpose of an extraction study is to characterize the package system and con components and establish worst case potential leachables uh, in a manner which can facilitate leachable studies. Uh, this allows a full understanding of extractables, and this study will uh, extract, controlled extraction studies will enable an assessment of a patient's exposure to uh, the chemical entities. But what about uh, changes at the N2, N3, or, or N4 level? Like I said, we don't have a uh, adequate control at those studies. So moving into uh, case study one, we have um, a, a change in Tyvek. Here, um, DuPont changed a uh, Tyvek that is usually uh, that is heavily used in pharmaceutical and medical packaging, and is used in sterile um, closures and is used to aid in the steam sterilization process. In this case, DuPont changed the way they manufactured their Tyvek, and that affected the whole industry, not, uh, not to mention just West. Here, West used uh, Tyvek 
package in their, uh, in their ready to use stoppers. So the question was, what will the change in the Tyvek and how will that affect the extractable profile of the stoppers that, that was packaged in, in Tyvek packaging? So here we used um, ICHQ-12 risk management and we designed the study to assess the severity, the occurrence, and the detection of uh, Tyvek extractables to the stopper extractables and we calculated a probability score. And then we used that uh, probability score to assess risk classes. So uh, risk classes with uh, ones and twos were uh, low and medium, and anything that had a risk class of three, that was a high risk that we really need to um, look and assess the, uh, how that would change the extractable profile of the rubber stoppers. So once we had an understanding of a whole bunch of different potential uh, risks uh, due to the Tyvek change, uh, we implemented some studies to assess how our risks uh, uh, would affect the, uh, the rubber stoppers. And here we uh, performed an extractable study of the uh, Tyvek, both pre and post change, and we analyzed some simulants uh, pre and post change using a variety of analytical techniques. Here are some of the results of our study. Uh, we extracted um, Tyvek um, in isopropanol using a reflux extraction method, and we performed a simulated autoclave conditions uh, in, in water, and we analyzed both those extracts and those uh, simulants using um, GC, uh, uh, GC MS methods using both um, direct injection and um, headspace uh, techniques. And here you can see some example chromatograms of our study. So we had extractable studies um, before uh, change and after change, and you can see that the extractable profiles did not change uh, very much at all. And the results of our simulation study showed that there wasn't any new uh, extractable compounds uh, coming from the Tyvek that was, uh, was, that was formed in our simulant, uh, simulant extract. So therefore, we concluded that there was no risk to extractable changes of the stopper due to the Tyvek change uh, that was forced upon us by uh, uh, DuPont's change in their manufacturing process. Heading into case study two, this was during a, a later stage in the development of a product. And uh, in this case, we had a uh, rubber stopper uh, and a glass vial. Uh, we had performed a uh, full controlled extractable, uh, controlled extractable study, and we wanted to see which of these compounds would uh, be uh, leachables. And we did that by performing a uh, simulation study. So here we, uh, uh, the, a careful selection of the simulation studies solvents will allow um, going from a potential leachables from the extractable study into more probable uh, leachables from the simulation study. So here in uh, this case, we uh, performed a controlled extraction of a rubber stopper used to seal a glass vial, and we also did a simulation study where we filled a glass vial uh, with a simulation solvent. In this case, it was uh, a one-to-one -one mixture of isopropanol and water, and we stored it in the inverted condition. That's what this picture is meant to imply here. It was stored in the inverted uh, condition for six months at uh, 4075. So both the extraction uh, or simulation sol solvent, the one-to-one -one isopropanol mixture, and the orientation were both um, aggressive uh, storage techniques. 
And here we compare some of the um, chromatograms that we can use to correlate the extraction uh, study data to the simulation study data. So here in the uh, inset, we have uh, a semi-volatile extraction chromatogram of a uh, refluxed rubber stopper. And here you can see we see some typical rubber um, oligomers, um, halogenated rubber oligomers, as well as a series of heavier alkanes. And these are all typical type uh, extractables um, from a variety of uh, rubber type stoppers that are used in the pharmaceutical industry right now. In the uh, simulation study, you can see that some of these uh, uh, halogenated uh, oligomers and uh, normal rubber oligomers were being observed above a concentration range of about 2 micrograms per, per 10 mils and some very small um, extractable or uh, compounds were migrating at a level of about one microgram per, per 10 mils. But here, this type of study allows a drug developer then to select the compounds that they want to uh, monitor in the drug product, uh, in the final drug product ma matrix as leachables. So the dr the drug dev developer could then uh, develop target uh, specific methods for these uh, target compounds in their drug matrix. Let's change gears a little bit now and talk about uh, extractable elements. Uh, we all know the toxicological concerns of class one elements and the need to monitor them in drug products. And while other elements are not as toxic as the class ones, uh, they can play an important role in the development uh, process, especially for biological compounds. For example, a variety of method metals have been known to cause protein aggregation or degradation or structural modification and hence the loss of activity of, uh, of the uh, biological uh, treatment. So, you know, we all know of the classical example of uh, tungsten arising from uh, pre-filled syringes to then cause severe aggregation of a drug product. So we want to try to avoid seeing that type of issue uh, early or later on in the de drug development process. We want to try to model the, um, model the interactions of biological compounds with potential metals, and we want to do that early on in the drug development uh, cycle so we don't get hit with a surprise when we're performing our uh, phase three uh, ex uh, leachable studies. So in this case, um, we performed uh, controlled extraction uh, studies on uh, glass vials and rubber stoppers used in the uh, pharmaceutical industry. And you can see uh, some of the elements that were observed in these studies. From the glass vials, we're, we were seeing aluminum, boron, calcium, sodium, sulfur, and silicon. In uh, rubber stoppers, we were seeing aluminum, calcium, iron, magnesium, silicon, and, and zinc. So the question is, how would some of these elements interact with the biologic? And how concerned are we, are we with these uh, elements being in the, in the uh, drug product exposed uh, to the um, biologic con container. And here uh, we can hopefully predict possible interactions of metals with the biologic. Skip over that side. And um, in, th in this case, uh, we performed a, a molecular modeling study on a biologic. In this case, it was a human lysosome. And uh, we chose a calcium as the element to model interactions with. 
And here you can see in the modeling that calcium, there was a, a nice gap, a uh, cavity inside the uh, uh, human lysosome where calcium could potentially uh, interact and potentially cause uh, interactions with the uh, human lysosome. So here we uh, performed a variety of studies uh, aimed to allow us to see if there was, in fact, any interactions going on between calcium and some of the other elements with the uh, human lysosome. So we performed size exclusion uh, studies, um, uh, SDS page studies, uh, differential scanning calorimetry or DSC studies, and some visual appearance studies as well as some ICP-MS um, studies. And here we exposed the human lysosome to a variety of elements at a variety of concentrations. So we chose aluminum, uh, silicon, zinc, cadmium, and magnesium and we exposed uh, these elements at concentrations ranging from 10 ppb to 100,000 uh, ppb. Uh, okay. And here are some uh, results of uh, the study. Here we were looking at the visual appearance or the op, uh, opalescence studies that we did. And here you can see that um, with calcium, there was um, an increase from the zero to one week to two week time point, but all of the concentration ranges uh, affected or interacted with the calcium in a pretty similar, uh, pretty similar study. But compare that to um, aluminum. Here, the responses were uh, all over the place. Uh, some of the different concentrations had market effect on the uh, um, opalescence of the human lysosome. So we can conclude that um, maybe that uh, aluminum had a, has a greater role in um, uh, interacting with a protein or the human lysosome than the uh, calcium did. Moving on to the size exclusion uh, chromatograms, uh, size exclusion study that we did, um, this is a uh, indication of any aggregation that's forming in, in the biologic. And here you can see an overlay of the T equals zero and T equals two weeks chromatograms. And for calcium, there has not been a great effect uh, in the, 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 the chromatographic uh, protein. Uh, profile. So you can say here with some certainty that there wasn't a great amount of interactions going on that would increase uh, protein aggregates uh, uh, with uh, uh, exposure to the uh, calcium. But over here in the aluminum side, you can see that uh, there was some marked differences in the uh, uh, chromatographic profile with exposure to the aluminum from the uh, T equals zero to T equals two week uh, profile. So you can say that um, the uh, aluminum was having a greater effect on the uh, uh, higher molecular weight protein ag aggregates being formed in this particular system. Going on to the uh, SDS page, here again, you can see that not much was going on as far as calcium interactions with the uh, human lysosome. But with the aluminum, you can see some differences showing, especially in the uh, 10,000 uh, to 100,000 PPP exposure of aluminum. You can see loss of bands here uh, of the um, uh, human lysosome uh, as it was exposed to the uh, to the aluminum. Going on to the DC uh, DSC experiments that we performed, here we're looking at um, uh, 
uh, protein unfolding and conformational loss of the protein as exposed to the different uh, metal ions. And you can see in the uh, calcium study, uh, exposure to calcium produced a six to eight degree decrease on the uh, onset of protein in unfolding, whereas calcium produced a nine to 10 degree decrease, as well as destabilization. Here, the peak shape of the, uh, uh, of the DSC gives an indication of the stability of the, uh, of the, uh, of the molecule. So the, the, uh, the increase in the peak width show that there's uh, a more destabilization of the, uh, of the biologic, the human lysosome, as compared to uh, the, the calcium. So this was a nice set of experiments uh, to perform to try to model and uh, then detect uh, specific changes of a biologic when exposed to varying degrees of uh, varying metals. Now this was a proof of concept experiment for us and we only modeled the human lysosome interactions with calcium. What would have been a nice experiment to perform was after seeing some of the uh, results of this study, a nice experiment would have been to go back and model the lysosome um, extra, uh, exposure uh, to aluminum and see what type of interactions could have had uh, been happening with that particular element. Unfortunately, that was not part of the scope of the uh, initial study and it, uh, uh, it wasn't performed. But nevertheless, you can see the, uh, how studies like this uh, can, uh, can help uh, if you perform them early on in, uh, in the drug development process. So that way you would know to mitigate exposure to specific elements earlier on so you're not hit with uh, a big surprise later on as you're performing your phase three um, uh, stability studies. You know, if you learn about it earlier, you can mitigate. If you learn about it later on in the process, you have, you're facing, you know, one year to two year or even longer delays in your uh, profile on, uh, in your drug development cycle unexpectedly, and that's not the type of situation a drug developer likes to uh, likes to find themselves in. So, uh, um, summer, summarizing here, um, the assessment of extractable and leachables should be performed throughout a product's life cycle. It's not just a one-time checkbox that you do early on in the drug product life cycle and never think about it ever again. You have to constantly be um, uh, performing these types of experiments over the entire range of the um, development to life cycle. And hopefully the three case studies that I uh, presented um, help stress this point. So I want to acknowledge uh, some people here. Erica, Diane, and Diego um, helped present or prepare all the uh, uh, experiments that were performed uh, that I just talked about in today's uh, presentation. And Catherine and Niels uh, helped with the molecular modeling and the uh, biologic uh, assays that were performed. So I want to take this time to thank you all for um, listening in to this webinar. And uh, I'll open up the floor uh, for questions, I guess, either for me and or for, uh, for Ken. Thank you for that, Dr. Q. Um, but just before we take questions, I believe Ken would like to revisit um, his survey questions just before we go through the question and answer session. Oh, very good. Okay, so just to you. take you back to Ken's presentation for a revisit to a slide, and he'll go through these survey questions now. Yeah. So sorry that we cannot uh, kind of send you the poll answer at this point. But what I can do is to go over the poll answer using the slide here. OK. So I can describe it real quickly. So first of all, for the drug product, and the answer we have is for C, we have 10%, D for 80%, E 
E for 10 percent, so that's the 100. And it's very clear that everybody would lean towards D as the minimum requirement for you to describe that data set as a legible data. And for those who pick C and D, for the next question here, the answer will get 6 percent for 50 to 150 percent, another 6 percent for 60 to 140, and then 53 percent for 70 and 130, and 33 percent for 80 to 120. So clearly, majority will prefer to have 70 and up, and that is good. But at the same time, this to me could be a challenging. Depends on which target analogy you're picking, you might get different recovery. So here, if you want to draw the line as we go down, we get D, C is where people make the cut. And then as far as the targeted analytical method goes, this is where it gets interesting. It's pretty much even all across. So A get 37%, B answer get 25%, and C get 37% as well. So it seems to me, as far as an analytical method goes, as long as this is a legitimate method, and you're doing a screening with a targeted method, you know what you're looking for, any of these three seems to qualify. Um, I think where it cut, where it cut off for me is between the targeted legible method versus the non-targeted method for screening. So for the screening portion, we have 10% for basically no screening method, and then 25% with screening method also, and then C has 65% where the cutoff is. So the way I read this response is, if you are running the study with either screening or targeted method, at minimum, you can use a screening method, but spike with known probable eligible in there. And to serve as your semi-quantitation, also as a marker or structure ID match. So that seems to be the cutoff. And as far as the packaging goes, this seems to be pretty straightforward that the majority are leaning towards A, 61%, worst case. As long as it's worst case, it bracket any other sizes. Um, B is 14%, C is 9%, and D is another 14%. So as far as the need for label, and interestingly, the majority is leaning towards a commercial approved label, D, 56%. C got 12%, B have 25%, and A have 6%. Now, the reason I say this is interesting is it, for most, I, I'm not sure how each one of you run the study. For most, when you perform the legible study, whether you go through all the way to labeling to get the package label and then store into stability condition for your study, you may not be able to get that. So. That is a tricky one, and it, it's interesting for me to see the 51% lean, leaning towards the label with full commercial approved label. And then the last one we have, as far as storage goes, A has 21%, B has 5%, C has 15%, D has the most 36%, and E has 21%. So if I want to split them, I would say D is where it cut off. So I think everybody leaning toward the ICH Q1A stability accelerator table. Now the interesting with the the Q1A versus the ASME as well as a factor of 10 rules, the Q1A specify the humidity, relative humidity. The other have no mention of humidity. And interesting from any definition, you never see humidity described in there. But it's interesting that we see and it makes sense if you do perform your stability study with this material, you run normal condition, also as a accelerated condition, using the ICH Q1A table. And there you describe that data set also as legible data. So this is where it cut off. So as I summarize, drug product, we cut off at D, recovery range, C, um, targeted method, not relevant somehow, but for screening method, non-targeted, at minimum have a spike compound in there, C. And packaging, worst case, is fine. Label, leading to worth commercial label. And then finally for storage, ICHQ1A at minimum. 
that's the input from all your all the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Ken, and thank you for your presentation done. Um, now we will begin a quick question and answer session uh, for the webinar. But once again, I would like to remind the audience that you can still send your questions in via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. As well as this, uh, or if you're watching this on demand, you can send your questions over to me at stephen.edwards at biopharma-asia.com and we'll get those answers back to you. So our first question is uh, for you, Don, in study two, you performed the simulation on products in the inverted orientation. Was the upright orientation evaluated, and how did the results compare to the inverted? Oh, yes, uh, we, we did uh, perform in the upright uh, condition, and um, there was not, uh, you know, you, we, we didn't see as many um, leachable compounds in the simulant uh, from that orientation. You know, there wasn't uh, intimate contact between the uh, simulating solvent, the one-to-one -one IPA uh, water, with the rubber stopper. So uh, there, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't uh, any migration taking place at that point. And I chose not to uh, present that data in favor of the, the data that did have the intimate contact, the uh, uh, inverted orientation that had uh, that showed that there was um, uh, uh, migration happening. So from that data, uh, we can then determine, okay, there there is possible migration that could take place. The inverted would be the worst case scenario, and then we should probably monitor those compounds. Um, as drug, uh, drug product leachables in the uh, final drug product matrix. Now, um, they, they, they might not be showing up, but we know that there is a possibility, so we want to go ahead and perform those uh, leachable studies uh, because um, our simulation studies suggested that migration could happen. Thank you. Our next question is, at what stage do you suggest uh, Staring extraction studies. Um, I always uh, suggest uh, starting as early as possible in the drug uh, drug uh, manu or the, the drug development process. But you want to make sure you have your formulation finalized and your container closure system finalized. So once you have uh, finalized those decision processes, it's, it's good to start the uh, uh, extractables and leachable studies. Uh, if you start earlier than that, you might have to go back and then duplicate some of your experiments because the formulation has changed or you decided to go with a different glass vial or rubber stopper. Um, if you wait until uh, those um, decisions have been made, uh, you can go forward uh, with the knowledge that you'll be uh, producing data that will help in the drug development process. The situation that you don't want to get into, though, and this happens uh, very often uh, in my experience in the contract research organizations, I would get a lot of uh, clients coming to me and thinking about extractable leachables only after the FDA or other regula regulatory body had asked them about that. And of course, th uh, these types of studies can take uh, a long time and be very resource in, uh, intense. So you don't want to be caught um, late in the day without any extractable leachable studies. You want to start that as early as possible, as long as you have the formulation and container closure system finalized. Thank you for those answers. Unfortunately, it looks like that's all the time we have for questions. Um, but before I finish the webinar, I'd like to quickly ask our presenters, once more Ken and Dr. Taku, if you have any closing remarks. Ken, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, so my my take is that you know the ENL has been in practice for many many years now, easily over 20 years, and more and more people is coming to this field. And as you can hear from Don also. And some of the thinking that I have gone through, you know, we're revisiting some of the old thinking, how things are done. And it's still challenging in some way because many of us are operating in terms of uh, assumption what regulator want and will perform the work. So 
sometimes we might perform too much because we don't want to have that conversation and or the company is not comfortable to get approach that conversation. So it is opportunity right now to engage and discuss things with anybody in any any conferences to better understand how things are performed and challenge the status quo. So I'm encouraging every one of you when you have the opportunity to challenge the status quo, if you think doesn't make sense, bring that up. Thank you. And Dr. Deku, do you have any closing remarks? Um, no, I don't think I have any uh, closing remarks other than to thank, uh, thank you, Stephen, and to thank you, Ken, for uh, joining me in this webinar, and to thank the audience for um, listening in. I hope it was an informative session for you. Well, thank you both, and I would like to take this opportunity to once again thank our presenters once more, Ken Wong, Deputy Director at Sanofi Pasteur, and Don Deku, Extractable and Leachable Technology Manager at West Pharmaceutical Services, for sharing their knowledge with us. I would also like to remind our audience that you can view this and other webinars on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com forward slash on demand hyphen webinars. And again, if you are watching this on demand, then please feel free to send your questions over to me at S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot edwards at biopharma-asia.com and we'll get those answers back to you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.